Ricky Ian Gordon is easily one of the world's most prominent living composers for the human voice. His songs have been performed and recorded by countless wonderful singers, and his musical theater works and operas have been heard on some of our most progressive stages, including his recent chamber opera, Ellen West, with Pulitzer Prize-winning poet Frank the Dart. Ellen West was recorded live at the Prototype Festival this past January. It's now available on CD and for digital download. And I'm thrilled to say that Ricky Ian Gordon is on the phone with me right now to talk about the project. Hi, Ricky. Hi, Brad. How you doing? <laughs> it's so nice to hear your voice. In this context, you have a great voice for radio. <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, I should mention, you know, you and I have a bit of a history. We've known each other since the 1990s, I guess. So. Yes, I know you as a singer, even. Yeah, back in the day, back in the day. Yes, I may be one of the only people who have heard you sing Michael Tippett's songs for doves. <laughs> 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 That's right. I think there's a recording of that floating around somewhere. A, a bootleg so recording. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's black market now. <laughs> black market, yes. But let's talk about Ellen West. Uh, Ellen yes. West is, as they say, you know, it's inspired by true events. I mean, she was a, a real person. Uh, tell our listeners, who was Ellen West? And give us a, a little bit of an idea of the story that you tell in this work. Well... Ellen West, first of all, is a pseudonym, but she was, there was a uh, Swiss therapist, a doctor and a therapist named uh, uh, Dr. Ludwig Binswanger um, and in Switzerland, and he treated a woman in his hospital uh, for an eating disorder and for things that there was not yet any language for. This is in the 30s. There was no, nobody knew words like anorexia or bulimia or even eating disorders. She just had, um, she had issues regarding her body, um, her gender, um, and she would starve herself and binge on food, and she was a very complicated and brilliant woman, including, by the way, she was a poet, um, but somewhat hamstrung by the um, poetic style of the time. Like, you know, there was not yet anything called confessional poetry, and people had to really search to find ways to express themselves honestly in poetry, especially a woman in her sort of condition. And um, so Dr. Binswanger was, I think, probably obsessed with her and fascinated with her because what he leaves behind is probably his most important work is the case of Ellen West. Mm. Um, it's a case study of this patient. And I think one of the things about her that was so compelling to him um, was that he couldn't save her. He couldn't heal her. He couldn't save her. It was like, you know, watching a a train going off a cliff. And um, he was both fascinated and distraught. And he wrote a fascinating case study of it. And Frank Bedart, when he was at Harvard studying with Robert Lowell, um, discovered this um, case study. And it sort of lived inside of him. Um, I'm sure he knew somewhere he was going to make something out of it. And then um, I, I think it was right after his mother died, he finally wrote Ellen West. And Ellen West ended up being, as he says in the prologue, um, writing Ellen West was exorcism. And um, I suppose it was for me as well. It's why I was drawn to, I discovered the, I discovered the poem. I discovered Frank Bedart in uh, the late 90s after my partner Jeffrey died and I sort of went on a pilgrimage because I simply had to leave my life, you know, and um, there was nothing in it for me at that moment. No, There was nowhere I could be where I was comfortable and I sort of instinctively sought out the company of poets and poetry because it was the only place I felt like I could sort of park my grief, you know, mm. And um, 
I discovered Frank, and I had never, ever seen poetry like his on every level. I had ne- never seen poetry like his, even visually, the way it looked on the page. Um, the subject matter, like one of the first poems that made him, that put him on the map was a poem called Herbert White, where he gets inside the head of a serial murderer, and it's a horrifying poem. It's like a, it's like going to a horror movie, and you can't believe a poet would so baldly express what he thinks is going on in the mind of a serial murderer. And he also wrote a poem in that style um, about Nijinsky, where he enters the mind of Nijinsky. And it became something he could do. Like, it, it became something he, was, he became famous for, this kind of um, personification of historical figures or figures that were made up based on historical figures where he seems to enter these people or this state of mind so deeply. And and with Ellen West, um, I felt when I read that poem, because I have struggled myself with eating issues my whole life. And, you know, look, he says Ellen was obsessed with eating and the arbitrariness of gender and having to have a body. I have struggled with all three of those things my entire life. And I, when I read Ellen West, I felt like no one had ever written. And I had written, you know, read like scientific, you know, um, medical literature about sort of eating disorders and the hungry self. And I had never read anything that took me so deeply into exactly what it was for me and what it was that I understood it to be. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And and so it shook me up, and it lived in me for years, and I always knew I would do something with it. And then finally in 2015, I just thought, I it's time to write Ellen West, and I, I got Frank's email and wrote to him and asked him for permission to make an opera out of the poem. And of course, the thing is, it was written even when I first read it, it's written in two voices. So to me, it was inherently dramatic and operatic. It's like a, it's like a conversation. And you set the entire poem, right? I mean, word for word, plus the yeah. prologue and the epilogue. Well, yeah, I set the whole poem. And then when I was done with it, I felt like I had, I felt like a, I had written a classical tragedy. And so I felt like I needed a prologue and an epilogue. Um, first of all, because I felt like I needed a prologue for contextualization. Um, you know, I didn't want to just start the piece with I love sweets, mm. which is the first line of the poem. I felt like we needed to know something about Ellen. So Frank very graciously um, obliged me by writing a beautiful um, prologue, somewhat um, somewhat uh, taking work from his other works. He had written a, a poem in the last few years, it was called Writing Ellen West, which was about, you know, 50 years after that writing, that poem, examining what made him write it. And so he used some of that, as well as some of the other poetry in his um, collected poems, Half Light. And then for the epilogue, he simply picked a poem in Half Light called Him that ended up being perfect.
It's interesting, you know, you come from a tradition of, you know, musical theater and and you kind of have a foot in both worlds of opera and musical theater. A lot of the work that you've done has has transcended category. But what I'm getting at is this idea of text being so important to your works. And when you look yeah. at when you look at a, a, a classical opera that people go see, you know, there may be a few lines of poetry that the composer takes and turns into an aria or a rhapsody, but you've got a lot of words here, a lot of text and a lot of really important text. How did you approach setting that and illuminating it and, and making it your own? What, what was the, the challenge for you and how did you overcome those challenges writing this piece? Well, okay, first of all, I was in love with the text, and I feel like by the time I began to set it to music, I had lived with it for so long. It it was so alive inside of me. I would often, like, I teach, right? And I, but I'm always a visiting professor. And I have often, especially if I've been dealing with young people, I will read that poem in its entirety to a class of people because I know how many young people suffer with eating disorders. And, um, and I have started so many conversations about um, that poem. So it, it, by the time I had decided to set it to music, I, just, I didn't treat it like a poem, Brad. I thought of it as an opera libretto, like mm-hmm. it was a finished libretto that someone had given me. And really, the, the most challenging part of it was um, Frank obviously doesn't write in any patterns, right? So there's, so in terms of creating a musical structure, a skeleton, you really have to decide what you're doing and how you are going to structure this piece so that it holds together. Um, there's also the, the, when Frank, um, when you look at a poem of Frank's on a page, part of his style is italics and capitalizations and the way words are arranged on a page. And you you want to, as a composer, find a way, an equivalent, for setting those, those things to music, for somehow emphasizing in the music when something is italicized, when something is in capitals. And so the piece had many of its own challenges, but sort of once I started, what really happened was the characters just, you know, that thing, the characters started speaking for themselves, and then I just felt like I was recording them. I mean, I decided early on that I wanted it to be, obviously, I wanted it to be small and chamber and playable because I knew it was a good piece for Beth Morrison and it had to be affordable. And that's and then Larry Edelson came on board from Opera Saratoga. So five strings and piano. And then I added the bell when Frank, um, when he gave me the prologue, Frank's later writing style, much later than Ellen West, he uses asterisks to sort of as a breath or as a, um, a pause. Um, and the way I interpreted them was when, when Jeffrey was dying, he wanted to die as a Buddhist. And at one point, someone sent a Buddhist monk to our house um, to speak with Jeffrey. And um, the, the Buddhist monk, for one thing, gave Jeffrey a present, a mala, you know, one of those necklaces that, and which was supposedly the Dalai Lama's brother, his hmm. mala. And then he gave Jeffrey Tibetan bells. And the, um, the, the, the way those, the Tibetan bells work is you, you, you ring them and you're supposed to let the, um, let the vibration of the bell ring until it's silent. And that is a way of clearing the air. So I thought of the bell, the sea glock, as a way of clearing the air. They were the equivalent of the asterisk. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So a lot of it, Brad, you know, a lot of it was seeking to find a musical language that was, that uh, complemented the poem and, and made it theatrical and that you could hear it and get the text. You know, the prosody was, itself was a gigantic task. Um, it was, it was, a, it was big. It was, you know, and I was, <laughs> at yeah. one point I was at Houston Grand Opera, you know, about to mount a new opera, The House Is Out of Christmas Tree, and I would get up at like four in the morning and work on Ellen West before I had to go do House Is Out of Christmas Tree. And so I was in the most split screen frame of mind. I mean, the two pieces couldn't have been more antithetical, you know? So it was, um, it's one of those pieces too, Brad, I'm really proud of it because it's one of those things that lives inside of you and you know one day you're going to do it, but you're afraid because you know how hard it's going to be and yet you know you have to. And yeah. finally, once, once I realized I have to do this, to you know that thing, when it's done and it's on a stage and you're watching it and you think, I brought those people to life. That is, I brought Ellen West and Dr. Binswanger and her silent husband to life in this piece. You know, it, it's very gratifying in the weirdest way that makes being a composer so addictive. Talk a little bit about the musicians that you collaborated with. You have on this recording uh, the singers Nathan Gunn and Jennifer Zetlin performing their roles, and the Aeolus Quartet, also Evan Primo uh, performing on bass, and Georgie Nesic at the piano. Um, well, let's start with the singers. I mean, these are demanding roles, especially for the soprano to, to put across. Can, can you yeah. tell us a little bit about them? Well, you know... First of all, Jennifer Zetlin. I met Jennifer. Um, first of all, I was a fan of Jennifer's before I met her because at one point, uh, Juilliard Opera Theater did um, Ned Roram's Our Town. And I had never seen it, and but I had a recording of it. So I went to see it, and Jen was Emily, and she was hair raisin Mm -hmm. in the scene in the graveyard i don't think i've ever seen an opera singer performing that way she was shattering i was 
sobbing, like snot coming out of my nose watching her. And I was like, who is that girl? And then I started hearing her. Like, then I went to New York City Ballet, and Peter Morton had choreographed a bunch of Strauss songs. And Jen was the singer, just singing from the pit so exquisitely. So then I was going to premiere my opera Morning Star um, in... Uh, Cincinnati and uh, Evans Mirage and I decided that we should get Jennifer Zetland to play the the daughter Fanny and I just fell in love with her and when we came back to New York I said Jen let's do some concerts and we did some concerts and then we ended up making a recording a recording called Your Clear Eye which got some really nice press and when it came time to do Ellen West in It's odd, Brad, in the back of my mind, I sort of knew somehow Jennifer's going to do this, but we didn't, that is not who we went to originally because Beth Morrison had done, um, had done Breaking the Waves with... Mm-hmm. Um, Missy Mazzoli's opera, yeah. Yeah, Missy Mazzoli's opera. And um, she wanted the soprano to do, um, to do Ellen West. For one thing, she's beautiful, but she's also bone thin. <laughs> it uh. would really be, you know. And um, so it then she got pregnant and couldn't do it. And immediately I said, "Look, let's just go to Jen Zetland. She can do this." And you know, it was it was we did it in Saratoga, and it was incredible. But it was also scary because Jen, you know, she felt like she needed to basically get really skinny and she she went on a very strict diet and at certain points she just seemed so frail and fragile and emotionally fragile like thank god the director was a woman the conductor was a woman emma griffin directed it and lydia yankovskaya conducted it because it it pressed a lot of buttons subject wise in jennifer that made it a very fragile room to be in when this piece was being created. And Keith Fairs, who did it, the baritone role in Saratoga, was just so lovely and warm and kind. Mm. A shout-out uh, shout to Keith Fairs, because he's uh, on faculty, you know, at Bowling Green State University, oh, just, just a, a few miles south of here. He's a great friend, and I love him. And he did it so beautifully um, in Saratoga. Nathan was already hired for New York. Mm-hmm. And um, so then, you know, when then when Nathan came aboard in New York, um, we had the piece had evolved to a certain place with Keith. And when we got to New York, Nathan is such a different artist than Keith. For one thing, Nathan's older than Keith. And Nathan wanted to approach it by finding physically three different characters in, in the husband, the doctor and and um, the basically husband, the Frank, doc- yeah, and Frank and yeah. Frank the poet, and he he just came up with. I mean, he freaked Frank out like in a <laughs> in a sort of good way. Frank was like, "Wow, I felt like I was watching me," and I had sent Nathan all these videos of Frank reading his poetry, and he sort of took little idiosyncratic movements and brought them into his own performance. And Nathan's voice is, you know, burnished and older and some, somewhat aged, and I don't say that in a bad way, but different than Keith's voice. Keith is a beautiful man with a beautiful voice, and Nathan just has this age and a little burnishment in his, you know, presentation. So it was very different. It was a different show. But it was also, it was interesting watching Nathan because somehow for him, the piece was devastating in a very different way. Like when Nathan would be the husband in the train ride, he he cried. I mean, he just, it re, the piece really tore him up. And I really think it's because he has five kids and he has daughters. And the idea, it seemed as though he brought something really paternal into the piece. Like, 
like the idea of of a young woman feeling this way and destroying herself this way really tore him to pieces. Well, it must be it must be gratifying for you as a composer, though, to see different artists taking on your creation and bringing different things to it. I mean, that speaks to the resilience of the piece itself, doesn't it? It's beyond gratifying. It's everything, Brad. It's it is. There are so many things about doing what I do, you know, as you know, that are privileged, but definitely probably the main one is the incredible people you get to work with and know, um, and know intimately because, you know, I don't really write casual music, Mm you know, as you know, Ellen West is not a casual piece. So to live with people and live with that work and see and to explore that kind of subject matter together, it was a very intimate experience. I mean, Nathan and I got really close, and of course, Jen and I already were, but all of us being in that room, you know, and I picked the Aeolus String Quartet because um, they had done a production of Green Sneakers, Brad, that I had directed in Maine, and... um, Green Sneakers is another opera of mine for baritone and, and string quartet and piano. And um, on the day the show was supposed to open, I collapsed and ended up in the hospital and was very sick for months. Mm. So I had this relationship with them already and sort of wanted to get back on the horse with them and complete something. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. So... It was just it was incredible putting it together, and I, I feel, and I hope, but I feel like it comes through on that recording. It's a very vivid recording of the piece, I think, in terms of it being live. You know, it feels very alive to me. Absolutely. And, and one thing I want to say about American opera and modern opera in general is people take on these big, heavy texts, and they don't necessarily approach them from... Um, I don't know, a sense of lyricism, a sense of cohesion. There tends to be a lot of kind of wandering going on instead of it being grounded. But I do sense the the groundedness and the lyricism in your vocal style and what you bring to this piece. So even though it's a great big, huge subject matter at its core, I think it has almost a message of reconciliation and hope to it because You know, right now we're months into the pandemic. We're, as we're speaking, it is election day here in the United States. Uh, We don't know what the future is going to hold. It seems like there's so much driving us apart. But a work like Ellen West kind of reminds us of the human condition, you know, and that we can't escape our own uh, struggles and our fears. And in a sense, I feel like that's what binds us together. Oh, I'm glad. I'm so glad you just said all that you said because that is how I feel about it. I feel like the piece, including the poem, is incredibly hopeful um, and meaningful. But you know, you get it's funny. The press person who's dealing with the recording called. She called me yesterday. She goes, "Do you know you're a controversial um, figure in the press?" And I was like. <laughs> Um, yes, <laughs> like, hello. <laughs> yeah. And, but then she sent me this great review of the CD, but at one point the, the guy was saying it was a shattering piece, not necessarily a pleasant piece to be in the audience of. And frankly, I don't think that is the experience that everyone had in the audience of it. I mean, like, you know, Vostek, you're not going to call being in the audience of Vostek, Vostek like, you know, scudder who, scudder hey. <laughs> but it's pleasant in that it's magnificent. And I I think when a work of art moves you, it doesn't have to be a pleasant experience because you're not just there for pleasantness. Yeah. I certainly don't write so that people can feel pleasant. I mean, it just, it was an odd thing to say. But the point is that for me, what's incredibly beautiful and hopeful about it is, yes, at the end of the piece, She commits suicide, but what she also does is she takes hold of her life, and 
there's to me there's such an amazing moment in the in the poem when it's it's right near the end when when um the doctor says on the third day of being home she is as if transformed for breakfast she eats butter and sugar for lunch she eats so much that for the first time in 15 years she is satisfied by her food and gets really full and she it's just it's this lovely thing about this exquisitely beautiful day she eats chocolate creams and easter eggs she reads poetry she listens to music and then that night she takes a lethal dose of poison mm. and but but she makes sure to leave the world having celebrated everything that she loved Because then the next thing in the piece, which is really Brad, the reason I wrote the piece, is her final letter, and it's a it's a letter to a friend who's still in the hospital, and it's the first lines of this letter that that stuck with me, and they are the reason I had to write the piece, and it's Ellen says, dearest, I remember how at eighteen on hikes with friends when they rested, sitting down to joke or talk. I circled around them, afraid to hike ahead alone, yet afraid to rest, for I was not yet truly thin. And the thing is, Brad, to me, just those lines alone are everything about why this poem had to be written that kind of crippling inner ideal that will not leave you alone, that that never gives you a moment's peace. And that is, to me, the death and the and the 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 destruction of eating disorders. And eating disorders are so often based on a kind of um perfectionism, a a, a feeling a, a feeling of lack of control elsewhere, um a need to be perfect, a you know, it's it's very real, and it's very and just somehow he gets it. And and the I the one of the things I did was I set the last letter. It was one of the first things I set because 
I thought if I get the last letter right, I'm going to be, I'm going to start on a good note. Like I'm going to feel good about where I'm going. And I'm really, I was really happy with the last letter. And then, um, and the way Emma staged it was at the end of that letter, Jen, there's there's the um, final music that circles the piece, the um, the dum bum bum bum, and uh, Jen took off all of her clothes and just stood naked, and then walked off the stage and rang the bell, and then draped herself like a Grecian figure, and and she and Nathan sang the epilogue. To me, it was just so it was moving. It, Emma Griffin staged it so beautifully. It sounds like there was a ceremonial aspect to it. I mean, you talk about the Tibetan yes. bell, which begins the piece as well. Yes. And that relates to, I think, the Greek chorus idea. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, there were two other characters in the piece that were, um, they served as orderlies in the hospital, but they were also, um, they were representations of the inner lives of the characters. They were, they were dancers. They were orderlies. It was, it was a very, um, to me, a very beautiful production on the stage. I was really, really yeah. proud of it. And I, I do hope it goes elsewhere. Of course, it was supposed to, but who knows what's going to happen with anything at this point. <laughs> yeah. Well, we do have the recording, and I, I can attest to, you know, just listening to the recording as opposed to, to watching all the images is certainly a powerful experience. I want to ask you about, uh, the the Maria Callas sort of rhapsody connection yes. here, uh, you know that attracted my eye when looking at the uh, the track titles, and attracted my ear when I heard little snippets of Tosca from the string quartet in there. But what really drives it home is this, and I sense this throughout Frank Bedard's poem, uh, the the sense of meta, where he sort of steps outside and he ties something together that you wouldn't necessarily think of, but she talks about the aria Visi d'arte, I've lived for art. Yeah. You know, what has art done to me? And how that relates to Ellen West and her story struggling with anorexia and body image. Can you talk a little bit about how you brought yeah. that to life? Yeah, and I, but I do want to say too, Brad, it's such a pleasure to talk to you. You're so smart, and you, the way you step inside of exactly what the function of that college piece is, is really a pleasure to hear. Like, uh -huh. that I didn't say it, you just got it. And the thing is, that's the brilliance of Frank, is that he took the piece out of history so that it's sort of in all history, and Ellen becomes mythological, and Maria Callas becomes a sort of um, historical counterpart because of the similarities, the, the idea of this, because Maria Callas also, on some level, felt like she she had to look as beautiful as her art. Mm. She knew she sang beautifully, and she felt she had to look as beautiful as she sang. And, of course, it ended up destroying her voice. But the, um, the, the thing about the Callas section, which is sort of right smack in the center, and is, um, yes, he keeps referring to um, to Tosca and to this one performance where of seeing Maria Callas and, and the second act and Visi Darte. But what's really important in that section as well is it's the section where uh, Ellen decides to die because... She's at the end of the college section. She says, um, I wonder what she feels now 
listening to her recordings, for they have already, within a few years, begun to date. And um, eventually she says, is it bitter that her soul tell her that she was an idiot ever to think anything material, holy, could satisfy? And then she says, perhaps it says the only way to escape the history of style is not to have a body. And until I was setting it to music, Brad, I didn't realize that that was the moment where Ellen decides that that's the answer, is not to have a body. Perhaps it says the only way to escape the history of stars is not to And it was such a strange moment because I had come all the way to the end of that section and nothing in the piece took as long to set to music as the college section. Even just the, you know, the, 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 to the clarity of weaving in Tosca all through it. Like the whole last part of it has, um, you know, is, uh, you know, uh, Cavaradossi is also, ba da 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 ba ba It's all through the last section of the college thing so just to weave that in but i get to is not to have a body and suddenly i was like oh wow this is that moment and of course then you have the only real long interlude in the piece yeah and um it was a sort of shattering moment <laughs> for me and i i immediately got in touch with frank and said that's what happens here right this is the moment when she decides to die and he said yes um so it's like it's that weird thing of like she sort of joins her counterpart at that moment and it could never have happened if frank kept kept the poem fixed in the historical context of the case study i mean and that's the brilliance of poetry and the brilliance of frank it's a, it's such a an alarming piece of writing to me because yeah. it's even slightly bitchy you know <sighs> it's even but it's also it's not as if she's looking outside of herself at college she sees herself as dated and and impotent as well yeah it's uh, incredibly powerful as is the entire piece. Is there wow. anything else that that you would say to listeners that are coming to this for the first time? I mean, a, a lot of folks, you know, on the surface may not be willing to take the plunge into listening to a, a work that is this uh, e- emotional and this powerful uh, and also a modern work. But what would you say to somebody who was uh, listening to it for the very first time? I would say that I think it's a really worthwhile journey, but it is not a piece you can dip into. It has, you have to be willing to listen to it from beginning to end because it is, it's, it's, in, it's in exact in inexorability. That is its power as far as I'm concerned. And that's how it felt when I said it to music. And when I got Frank to write the prologue and the epilogue that it is of a whole, you know what I mean? And um, I think that we've become in our society, especially with music, because you can download a track, right? And you can download an aria. I think it's probably not a mistake to say that people really dabble in music a lot. And when I was growing up, and where I come from, is I was obsessed with opera, and I listened to whole operas following the libretto and listening to scores. I mean, that was my life. So 
you know, that's the tradition I'm coming from. I'm not sure if you just listen to the prologue, you're going to get Ellen West. Right. You know what I mean? Um, so if you're willing to put in the time, which that's, that's to me what opera is, I think, I, you know, I think the piece has um, incredible rewards. I'm very powerful. I'm very proud of it, you know. But it, it's hard to convince people of those things, Brad. Like, you can't say to someone, you can't just read the first scene of Streetcar Named Desire and know the play, you know. But yeah. people wouldn't even think to do that. But in opera, very often people dip in, like, here or there and think they know the opera and unfortunately it's a form that demands more of you and i i don't say that to be like a school mom i say it because it's where i'm coming from you know and i i just i hope eventually um opera not only wins itself back but I have a fantasy that one day opera again has audiences that, you know, even critics who ask for scores. Like, you know what? I've never, I've never, I've been writing music for a long time. I don't think one critic has ever asked me for a score. Hmm. I can't imagine it was that way when I was a kid. Like, don't tell me no one asked Samuel Barber for a score of Vanessa before they reviewed it. I mean, why doesn't that happen anymore? How can someone know what you've done when they can't even look at it on the page? (laughs) That's a whole other subject. But (laughs) nevertheless, that's what I would say. And I I also do think that it's one of the most startling, amazing poems written in the 20th century by definitely one of the most important American poets in history. So even if you hate my music, at least (laughs) listen to the text. Well, I, I would say, you know, just as it was a, a cathartic experience for Frank Bidart to write the poem, and it was cathartic for you, an exorcism of sorts, to write the musical setting of it, listening to it is also a cathartic experience because we're dealing in archetypes, and even though specifically you're talking about struggles with body image, I mean, that's a very contemporary, yet stretches back through history struggle that people have had with themselves yes. and fitting in, you know, and, and yes. everybody, whether they will admit it or not, can absolutely identify with Ellen West and her story. So I think it's, it, it is, as you say, important to experience the whole thing from beginning to end. We're only asking for about 70 minutes of, of folks' time, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's time well spent. Absolutely. I hope so. Look, people go to the movies. <laughs> That's true. You know, it's it's like that, you know. Yeah. It's so nice to talk to you about it, Brad. You know, you're really a thoughtful, smart guy. Of course, I always thought that we were friends from the moment we met. But I haven't talked to you in a long time, and it's really nice to talk to you and about something like this that I really feel like you get. The opera is Ellen West, music by Ricky Ian Gordon, and the poetry of Frank Bedard. Uh, It's available now. We'll link to that album on our website at WGTE.org, plus Ricky's own website, so you can uh, listen to it, order it, and uh, read all about it again at our website. Ricky Ian Gordon, thank you so much for your time today, and thank you so much for this, this wonderful opera. I really, really, really enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Brad. Have a great day.